Yeah, so I think we slowly start. Yeah. So it's a great pleasure to host the fourth lecture on healthy aging with the title Aging Our Best Opportunity. And for this, I like to introduce a Professor Nicola Palmarini, who will give the today's lecture. But beforehand, mm -hmm. a couple of housekeeping notes. So the first thing that you all know, this webinar will be recorded. And it will be also for publicity purpose and anybody can listen and hear to these uh, lectures also afterwards if they didn't have a chance to attend. Attendees will be able to ask questions at the end or during the presentation. There's a Q&A section where you can leave your questions and we will answer them after the presentation. Please don't ask medical questions because we can't give you any medical advice uh, uh, on this webinar. Uh, there will be also a satisfaction poll and survey at the end of the webinar. So please also leave the comment if you're happy with this or not, so we can change it perhaps in the future. And if there are any technical issues, please use the chat button to communicate with the event organizer and uh, they will help you to sort out problems very quickly. So having said this, I really like to introduce now our today's speaker. Uh, Professor Nicola Palmarini. Uh, he's an author, teacher, applied research scientist, and currently um, Nick is director of the UK based National Innovation Center for Aging, also called NICA, N I C A. And uh, I think this institute is very interesting, having looked at the website. Uh, they co develop and bring market products and services to end consumers, enhance and improve all aspects of life for our aging society. Now, I think that's really important to bring not just scientists together, but also criminalization experts, innovators, technologists. So it's a really multi-pronged approach and not just uh, pure academia. I think that's very important, but I'm sure uh, Nick will tell you much more about this. But before Nick got his directorship at the Institute, he trained in social sciences, business communication, and was actually a research manager at the MIT, IBM, Watson, AI lab. So having said this, I think, Nick, that's enough background. Now let's talk about aging. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Andreas. Let me share the screen and hope everyone can see it, right? Okay, thank you. So Andreas, again, thanks for the intro. Thanks for inviting me. It's such a honor and a pleasure to be here today. Um, we have more or less 45 minutes, so I'll try to uh, drive you through a journey that I hope will give you the complexity and the beauty of the opportunity that we had ahead about aging and longevity. You will see, I will feed you on, a, on this journey of, let's just say, things I've learned over my life, things I think have become relevant, things that from our research perspective, in, uh, in our opinion, are signing some uh, landmarks on what's happening around this, this domain. I hope I can challenge some of your assumption on the topic. I hope I can be provocative enough to generate some question at the end so that you will see probably a view that it's, I will say, somehow very well shared globally, but maybe we'll have some nuances that in the end of the presentation, you will see how we at the center are trying to translate in a practical application so that all these, let me say, summa of uh, inputs that I will drive you through somehow are finding a way to be translated in practical actions. That's what we try to do every day. Because I think that the key point here is just talking about the concept of the, of the opportunity. Uh, I just did this chart literally uh, 35 minutes ago. I'll try to do it the, as fresh as I can. And I usually use this chart just to set the stage about uh, some thinking around the concept of aging where most of the time we think about problems and a lot less of the time we think about the opportunity. That's why I'm pushing the word opportunity today because I think it's important that we start looking from that perspective since this is one of the two mega trends happening to our planet as well as global, uh, uh, global change. I mean, the global, uh, global warming, the, the problems related to the uh, critical status in which our planets live. But on the other hand, we have this global demographic trend, which somehow is something stated. You know that Japan 
together with Italy, and by the way, I'm Italian, I'm sure that you're a spot from my accent, um, it, Japan and Italy are the fastest aging country in the world. So for, for me as an Italian, it was quite normal, it was quite normal to be in a world in which we are, which is not the same for many other countries, because basically the demographic status is this one. So by 2050, 31 countries included China, which is, as you can see, from a demographic perspective and from a size perspective of the country itself, from a cultural perspective as well. It's literally become a game, we will become a game changer more and more in the space. But we, Italian and people from Japan, we're already in this situation. We've been in this situation. So I think we have heard a lot and, and understood a lot about how it's important to translate from what we think it's a problem in an opportunity. I don't want to um, let me say, bother you with the demographic things. I guess we all know what is happening at the global level. So I, again, I don't want you to, uh, uh, let me say, to uh, play a redundant story. Uh, that's what it's happening. We're just doing less children and population tends to live longer. That's why this is happening to the world. And I think that uh, one of the things which is important to remark is that over the course of the last half century, the life expectancy has continued to increase steadily by the two years every uh, each decade, meaning that basically every 10 years we have lived or gained an extra 20 percent, quote unquote, free of life, meaning that it's free because we did nothing. We just learned. We just lived. Research has progressed. Our uh, lifestyle has changed thanks to the information we received. Internet obviously played a huge role in understanding a lot of the information that before were only shared between, let me say, close encounters. Um, but right now, I think this is something which is happening. And I think it's, a, it's not a surprise that, that we're growing. I mean, we want to leave. We're just doing our best to leave. I think what it's changing is the, the nature of, all, of old age itself, which is slightly different from what it was before. But just to st st set the stage, it's not an absolute novelty that we're living longer. I just picked three people quite famous in history and see, they didn't have famine uh, plague war. Uh, uh, sorry, they had it, but they didn't have antibiotics, vaccination, organ transplants, and they did it well anyway. And one thing I want to remark is that something that uh, it's important, and you will see also later in my presentation, how much of the work about these three people has been done in later life, meaning that living longer is just not living longer waiting to die, just living longer and, you know, improving the society, just be part of the society, find a meaning in our own life along the whole life stage of our life, not only, let me say, in certain um, uh, early stage of it. Um, one thing about Italy uh, that I want to remark, which I, which I guess for many of you will make uh, absolute sense, because I'm not going to say anything new, but the point is that sometimes it's, we need the science to see what it's obvious. But anyway, if you go to Acciaroli in Italy, which is in southern Italy, you will find that the highest number of centenarians in the world, there is one every 10 inhabitants. It's a small village, okay? So we're not talking about uh, statistically a huge number, but statistically on the other side, it's a huge number. So it depends on how you see it. Then the point is that what makes such a role what it is? And uh, there was has been a very interesting study from the University of San Diego and the La Sapienza in Rome, which basically were trying to understand why Acciaroli has this demographic, let me say, uniqueness. And if you see there on the right, I framed it in black, basically main themes for qualitative interviews sorted out the positivity, resilience and optimism, working hard, bond with family, spirituality and religion, land, stubbornness. I mean, the, Am I saying something new? I don't think I'm saying something that you don't think are the crucial things to make us live a, living happier and longer in our life. So what I'm trying to say there is sort of a foundational things that belongs, I would say, to all of us, but are more, let me say, structured, mainly culturally in some areas of the world than in other areas. But again, there's nothing new. It's a good diet. It's living uh, connected with the others, is uh, being in a nice place. Uh, where the, probably there is a lot less pollution than in other places. Again, I'm not saying anything new, but anyway, it's still something that we have to look for because it's something which is still missing, which puts one thing. If you, if you see the life expectancies of countries all over the world, you see, and again, 
many of you will recognize themselves in this chart. And the other things I just wanted to highlight is that typically we don't think about this country or some of this country as the most advanced, while we always have a reference about the United States as our, let me say, a driver for innovation, for the future, for the quote unquote, the American dream. And the American dream is placed at 43. And it's, I mean, lowering because this data is changing a lot, for example, due to many factors. And I'm not talking about the pandemic. I'm talking, for example, the opioid pandemic in the United States, which is literally showing that sometimes there are so many factors that probably should have to be considered slightly differently when we think about what is the evolution of, of a country and a health system of a country. And the American one is really a disruptive one. I lived there for uh, seven years and coming from Europe where we have the classic national health system, looking and seeing literally people dying in streets outside the hospitals because they couldn't afford to be admitted to a first aid was really heartbreaking and allow me to see how much we have to do, let me say, in the social systems, even before in all the other systems. Uh, three takeaway that I think it's important to mark today. We are reaching all day in the general better health. So that's something that I was trying to squeeze in the first three, four charts. So there's a lot happening in the research and I'll show you something that it's progressing us towards this direction. Forget about the pandemic again for one second. I mean, it's very hard to forget about it, but in general, the trend is this one. The second point is that we finally realize that we are individuals, we're unique. So there is not a fixed program for aging. Uh, it's caused mainly by lifelong accumulation of damages. So it's important to understand these damages. And as I said before, uh, the change in, in lifestyles and the understanding what it's good and what it's not good, let me say in general, for a population, because I think that progression is, is on the individual, not on the population. But nevertheless, from a general perspective, we are understanding that if we reduce these damages and we identify them and then re reduce them, then we can live longer. And finally, I think the key word here is, is the word malleable. You see that uh, what I think we have progressed in the last 50, 60 years is realizing that aging is not fixed again, but there are so many nuances that can help us literally to shape uh, our aging process uh, uh, towards the time. I always use this analogy. Think about aging as a piece of stone, um, and it was uh, something untouchable up to, again, 50, 60, 80 years ago. So take this piece of stone, think it's a piece of marble, and then put Michelangelo in front of that piece of marble with a chisel, and you, I think you can see what you can do. I mean, you can shape that piece of stone and make it a fantastic statue. Now, who is the Michelangelo? It's ourselves. Each one of us, I think, has the chisel to shape that piece of marble or something that represents himself, herself, and shape a trajectory of aging and then longevity that could be very different. And it's mainly on our own hands beside our heritage and our genes, obviously, which plays an important part. But again, it's more and more clear that we have the tools to try to shape our process of aging slightly different uh, from each um, and everyone else. Now, these chisels are uh, something that are suggesting us that we can translate what is happening from my First takeaway, if you want today, start talking instead of healthy aging, of a concept of healthy longevity. And then I think longevity is probably the word that we should have to resonate the most in, in, in the next years, even today, but in the next years, because as a lot to deal, not with the process of aging itself, but in the process of understanding how we can improve our life, not when you, we are 60, 70 or 50, but when we are 30 or 20. So it's a matter of understanding that the fact that we can live a healthier, longer life, it's related on all our life cycle. And it's something that obviously now it's taking place in our narrative every day, but it's not so obvious. So I think it's important that if we start talking about healthy longevity, we're fusing two concept of living healthier for longer in a process that I think requires um, our full attention, because obviously has an impact over our own life, but over the old systems in which we're embedded. Now, I was talking about chisels before, uh, about shaping that stone. Let me show some of these chisels. 
um, this is one uh, network of patients which are sharing openly the treatment that they're uh, uh, curing themselves. So I try to explain what works, what doesn't work and share with others so they can improve their treatment. Um, this is a fantastic company based in Cambridge, which has uh, basically stickers you put over your muscle and they can read the, mi the micro movement of your muscle and help others to design tools that can help you to live longer. Uh, there's a lot happening in artificial intelligence applied to understand from, for example, a scan of the skin, how we are aging. There's a lot uh, happening in robotics that can help us to do things that we couldn't do anymore or help us to recover from uh, an injury, for example, that we had before. And this thing is progressing more and more thanks to the combination of technologies that I showed before. There's a lot happening, let me say, in the discovery of metabolic tools that will help us to switch some of the cell processes that can help us to live longer. And there is a lot in terms of science and research happening. For example, you probably heard about this company which is working on Sir twins. Here is an activator of the coenzyme NADA+. I don't want to go in that science. Honestly, it's very important. It's progressing. What is more important for me today, and again, just talking about the opportunity, is showing you what's happening in the background. And that's why it's important that we discuss about it. Because these type of approaches are coming to the mass market. So that, for example, now you see how this product is sold, basically is a supplement, which, by the way, is not FDA approved. So it's sold, uh, let me say, on uh, in, in, the, in the free market. And you see how it's sold. It's sold just like it's a beauty product. It's sold by subscription. So you can only have it if you buy yearly or monthly. Uh, and it's sold with a completely different narrative. By the way, Elysium has eight Nobel Prizes in the scientific board and is raising little huge investment from uh, many funders. Now, what is interesting to show what is happening on the market is that if you have this, let me say, top-notch type of offering, you also have the same type of product, exactly the same composition, basically, by the competitor, which, by the way, is the company which is providing the active ingredient to the previous one. So they decided to enter in the market as well with true Niagen. And now this product, it's also backed up by investor in Hong Kong, and it's reaching the, the Chinese market quite broadly, meaning that there's something happening that we must be aware. So we have to be aware as researchers, as people that are looking at the opportunity and also the challenges in this case of aging up to the point that there is literally a so-called life extension death match. It's life extension in this case, specifically the right definition. Well, it's a challenge definition because we're talking about uh, supplements that potentially could help you live longer, healthier. It's proved not. That's the point. So there is still a lot of work that have to be done formally to be scientifically proven. But there is a lot of science that it's going further to show that it could be formally proved. So we're at the borderline to have clinical trials more extensive and more deeply done that are suggesting that potentially this could be true. Again, my point is not literally on the science today of these type of, of supplements. My point is about what is happening in the background because this thing is on the market and people is buying it. And in fact, you see someone is suggesting, can we make it more democratic, lower the price and give it to everyone? Up to the point that there are people, and Jim Mellon is the founder of Juvenescence, which is the company I showed you before, which are suggesting that investment in longevity is probably one of the biggest opportunity that we have ahead of us. And if you think about back again, as I told you before, uh, the two things happening to our planet, climate change and the demographic revolution, you see there are opportunities on the business of both. Now, the business of both Anyway, end of the day, forget about the revenues. It's just to try to design a better life for us on this planet. Now, people like Jim Mellon and many others uh, are, let me say, so convinced that you can improve your life by using some, uh, uh, I would say, drugs in this case on the market. They're combining, and you can find in literature and, again, in many 
uh, articles right now what it's called the longevity cocktail that many people in the field of longevity is taking. Again, here, as Andreas is saying in the beginning, we're not recommending anything. I just want you to be aware of what is happening. I think it's important we as researchers are aware. So the combination of cardioaspirin, um, of uh, um, uh, uh, anti-cholesterol drugs, uh, of vitamin B12 and metformin, which I guess in this play is the key, is something which is taking shape. Now, there is a pretty long literature about how metformin, besides uh, taking care, helping you to defeat diabetes type 2, is a drug that more and more has been somehow proved to be effective in person with diabetes and cancer, for example. Taking metformin help people to live slightly longer. And the point is that has been brought so much ahead by people like Professor Nir Barzilai that he was be, has been able to suggest to the FDA a clinical trial to use metformin uh, independently from a disease or specifically a disease related to diabetes. So now there is a trial over 3,000 people in many universities, in many uh, hospitals, as you can see out there, that is suggesting that you can take metformin independently of the disease you have to live longer, okay? I don't, I'm not, a, let me say, a follower of the idea that aging is a disease, but from a pure medical uh, point, you see there are many people, many doctors believing that aging is a disease because of the progress of aging causes you certain type of diseases. Therefore, you're aging, you have a disease. So as you can see from the schema that I take from, that I took from the AFAR website, which is leading the research on TAME, and TAME is the, the target in the biology of aging through uh, metformin, you see that aging at the bottom left is cured. And again, for me, it's not have to be cured, but again, in this specific type of approach is cured through metformin. Now, there's a lot happening uh, from many perspectives. The point is that certain science uh, is becoming a commodity. So think about having a DNA test uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, was literally something for a specific lab. Now you can do at home with all the ethical implication you can imagine, you can see. But uh, for example, there is a, a Nebula Genomics, which is probably the one, the only one available on the market, just like you can buy to tomorrow, uh, that in, if you're living in the United States, uh, that somehow is sequencing all your um, uh, genoma. But the point is that the way it's sold, so it's becoming literally a commodity up to the point that if you buy it, you can also re receive, a, if you want, a subscription to Netflix or a discount on Amazons. Uh, you, you see where I'm going. That's my point. I think it's more relevant and important to understand what is happening because this science is raising up from the depth of the labs and it's becoming part of our daily life. And I'm showing you Elysium, which is the company I showed you before, literally is now selling things in bundle. And the logic of the bundle was just like a logic that we used to have, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago buying, you know, you were buying a TV set and they're giving a bundle, a VCR or a DVD reader. Now in bundle, you have this type of uh, applications together of testing um, your, for example, metabolic journey and then having drugs to care about it. Uh, suggesting that that idea I was putting before about the fact that, that it's not almost anymore for the world population, but it's for you as an individual, that this type of approach is uh, reaching more and more uh, wider and broader population. This is a voice member. Voice is a community that we at the center in Newcastle have uh, as one of our best tools because it helps us to involve the population in every discussion we, about, we do about aging and longevity. So it's a community of people over 55 working literally with us. It's more than 8,000 people that we involve in our process. And I think this sentence tells a lot about what I told you before. There's a more and more information about what is about living longer. Um, but the point is that I don't know where to start and I have no idea if I'm doing the right thing or if it's making any difference. Uh, I think if we can stop the, uh, my speech now, we spend five minutes over Google and talk about, or uh, sorry, look for on, on Google, uh, I don't know, longevity diet. You will have hundreds of suggestions what could be a longevity diet. Uh, you can have hundreds of suggestions on if uh, raspberries or blackberries could be good for you, and then you start eating them. But they're really good for yourself? 
question mark. And that's what I'm saying it's happening. I guess we are reaching a first plateau where we are aware about the damages that we can cause to our life and we can avoid it. But then what it's good to avoid it, it's still not yet clear. And again, you go by attempts. So there is no support and there's not enough education in about something which is becoming broad and huge. Still Elysium or, or Chromadex, those products I showed you before are still for a niche of people. The so-called longevity cocktail that I showed you before, it's still for those that strongly believe in that thing and honestly are putting their own health at risk because they don't know, we don't know, I don't know if it's working or not. But the suggestion that it could work is becoming a sort of a mainstream narrative, which can cause opportunities and risks. And one of the risks is societal. So all the things that I told you before, it's sitting on a paradox. The longevity revolution in which we are is, and it's a, it has a danger, that's the one I was trying to say before, is that this society is not ready for the world that we are creating. So we're just first time ever in our history, um, surrounded by people who are gonna live longer and longer. The planet never had such an, a huge amount of people living um, for such a long time all together in, in these huge numbers. Is the society we're designing ready? No. And then one just simple nuances that I showed you before is, for example, the information. Yes, now we have channels like, again, the web that allow us to reach information so broadly, but is the society so smart to have designed a system of education of what you're reading? How you can spot the fake news? I come from artificial intelligence as a part of my background, and you can literally see how system can create, thanks to natural language processing, very smart and well-designed engines uh, generate information that are not verified by anyone. Yes, you can use the same technology to spot them, but it's a very hard game in, uh, in, a, in a way in which this information is spread all over. For, so the society is not ready from many perspectives. One of these perspectives is about the narrative, and we go back problems and opportunity. Aging is treated like a, um, a problem. It's treated like something bad that it's happening to us. It's, it's treated just like the worst thing that happened to you up to the point that we all know that we always say, oh, that's the silver tsunami or the aging time bomb, I mean, disasters, okay? So the first thing is about the narrative. The narrative leads us to one point. Age is a discrimination. Uh, it's uh, something exactly like a racism, sexism. Uh, and even if we have not solved at all racism, sexism, uh, because obviously we all see the issues that we have in these two discriminations, there is, a, there is a point about ageism, which is a discrimination that they not yet recognize it as uh, ageism and sexism. Again, uh, not solved, sometimes hard to recognize, but at least there is a huge narrative out there that is suggesting that we should have to be aware of. It's not the same for ageism. Um, the word ageism as discrimination has been uh, uh, defined by Professor Butler in 1968. Uh, ageism affects all the age. So you are too old to do this job. You're too young to do this job are two both uh, ageist uh, uh, sentences. Uh, point is that uh, when ageism hits the later life, you don't have much time or you don't have much energy to fight against it. You literally are marginalized while potentially when you're younger, you still have opportunities to, uh, let me say, improve, fight, um, find the, uh, let me say, tools to help you come out from that situation. If you push people in their later life in an age situation, it's literally becoming very dangerous. And I guess we had a, a classical proof along the pandemic where the equation was you're old, meaning you're vulnerable. Nobody say the word in the beginning. We all thought of that thing is something that is crystallized in our mind. And then you're disposable. OK, this flow that has been in the narrative immediately. So in March, the 10th, the, the, the 5th, everywhere in the world, this equation has become some of a given assumption. And nobody basically questioned until we realized that we literally were telling the people you're going to die you're vulnerable, you're weak. And there were people in their 80s, 70s, 90s, which has normal average life. But by design, we think this thing. The, the thing is that this discrimination, and from my chart before, you see from the Google 
search on books they are talking about ageism, how low is ageism in compared to other discrimination, is showed by the fact that the WHO took 52 years to realize that ageism is a discrimination. Everyone was, you know, promoting this thing about what is the, the WHO is doing now. And I, I'm so happy that it's becoming a, a, a scream out loud in, in our life. Uh, but I think uh, um, what I would like to remark that maybe it's a little late, probably we should have to do it a lot earlier because there is a huge population which is being affected by ageism. We're all ages. This is my, um, my bathroom uh, shelf where you see all those yellow frame things are products which are anti-aging, meaning they're anti myself, against myself, since aging is one of the most natural processes. And someone finally is realizing, just like Alur magazine, they decided to um, not publish any more products or articles. We're talking about the anti-aging. It's the end of anti-aging. You see some products which are uh, now, for example, in the beauty industry, not using this thing anymore because they realize this is a bad narrative that's literally affecting the people. Finally, this magazine on the right decided to go exactly against the flow and decided to name their headline anti-age, which is quite um, fun, let me say. Uh, important things that are happening in the background, advertisers are ages by the fact that they don't recognize there is a market out there because they spend 500% more millennials and all the other age groups combined. Uh, and again, so sorry, the, uh, all the other age groups combined, and meaning that they don't see there are people which are aging. While, for example, um, the McKinsey Global Institute is suggesting that probably is this population, which is literally the owner of uh, an economy that we have ahead of us, that probably we should have to promote and sustain because it's the economy that can help the world population to, you know, to thrive, live better, and generate a new economy for the others. Funny, uh, Moody's, uh, not later than three years ago, that was a dispatch about what was happening. This specifically related to Italy. And Moody's, it just like telling us, um, healthcare, uh, yes, uh, care products, they will do well, but not at all about, you know, clothing, footwear, uh, restaurants. I mean, it just like aging is related only about health. And all the rest, and health, I mean the hard health, drugs, uh, hospitals, uh, operations, all that kind of stuff. Not, let me say, all the other you go there, you meet friends, you go out, you socialize, and maybe you eat decent things that could be helpful for your health. But for Moody's, that was not the market. Probably just because Moody's is thinking about this population. When you think about the older adults, we probably have a classic picture of people living in certain situation, playing the tamburello, like in Sardinia. This is a picture taken from there all day long, which I have nothing against about them. That's people that have been surrounded all my life. I celebrate them, I support them, but there are other people. Where are these people in the Moody's uh, topic? Where is the style in the pandemic? Do we have a style when there is a, a problem so big out there? Yes, we do, because we are who we are. We are different. We are individuals. We like what we like. There are things that makes me happy that are different from yours, and I'm happy to push them forward, whatever the stage of my life, whatever the style of my life, whatever the intention in my life. And just pick, you know, just a few pictures of the billion you can find out of people that, thanks also to the social media now, can scream out their individuality and they scream out the fact that they're alive and they belong to this society. Someone make a business. This couple is just become pretty famous on Instagram, selling the story of themselves pairing together up to this guy, which is an Italian entrepreneur who decided to quit his life as an entrepreneur and now is a resident DJ in Ibiza. Meaning that that life is, I would say, is broad, not only long, is has a lot of potential nuances that I think we should have to support and celebrate. This is a goalkeeper, which at 75, following this research that you can find in um, in one of the Joe Coughlin book, it says that only 35% of people over 75 sell, say that they felt old because we're changing in our process of aging. It, it's wrong to say that the 75 is the new 65. 
because 75 are 10 years more than 65, okay? Those 10 years makes the difference. It's the experience, it's the wisdom, it's who you are. But it's true that thanks to all the things I told you before, our awareness, uh, it's, let me say, pushing our 75 is slightly different in how we feel and how the society somehow, if on one hand it doesn't recognize us, as older adults in the same time is providing a lot of stimulus that we could potentially live uh, the kind of a fancy life. This guy is a goalkeeper, was a professional goalkeeper in the 70s. He quit, he took two degrees, and now at 75, he decided to come back and play professionally, meaning that you can do things in life that probably you didn't think about, but there is nothing, let me say, exceptional. It's just about yourself being yourself. Um, Boomer List, a book from ARP a few years ago, somehow is suggesting that there is a new generation of older people. And again, we can frame as boomers, but again, it's pretty broad because boomers goes from 1946 to 1964 as, as a time frame. And how big is that time frame? How many things changed? How many boomers? For how long they've been exposed to the internet, for example? I'm, uh, I was born in 1964, so I'm the last year of the boomers. I've been in the internet for 30 years, more or less. So yes, I'm not a, a native digital, but I'm digital. And if you think about the classic narrative about the fact, oh, you're old, so you don't use uh, these tools. It's not true. I'm using this tool as many people far older than me. And there are new narratives that are popping up celebrating this type of aging, meaning that, for example, in this case, there is a company that when they start putting ladies with gray hairs in the later life, they raise the people that were looking at that and celebrating with a huge success um, in terms of, of feedbacks and followers. Uh, do we care about followers? No, but it's a metric that tell us that somehow when you post out something that maybe you didn't think obvious, again, think about the investors, probably it's where the narrative maybe could slightly change. You all know about the happiness curve. You all know there is this trajectory that goes, let me say, the lower uh, side of our life around our 50s, we have our crisis, and then it's true that when we get older, we just realize at least who we are not, okay? So there is a clearly point in which we realize who we are not, and maybe we can learn who we are, okay? But then it's a classic curve. Now, this line is typically represented, as, as you can see, very, very thin. That's my point. I tend to try to tell a different story. Life is not only long, it's wide. So as you see, that line should be that big, even bigger, because every day it's full of things that we're doing together. And I think it's not anymore a U curve. In my opinion, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a like this curve. It's a wave that is going up and down. And since we're living longer, probably we have a crisis in later life. Crisis, which is also sustained by the fact that, that as you can see here, um, we tend to deliver products to the older adults, design it in a certain way. Are we these people? Are we, and there is a very famous case history like this one from Gerber, which decided to put uh, these products thinking that they were good for the single older adult. And it was a huge failure because it's just screaming, as you can see, I live alone and I eat my meals from a jar. That was the, let me say, the sub-label that was not written in this label. Are these the products that we want to deliver to these people? As I said before, there is a movement happening in getting back your gray hair. So for example, people start realizing that be who you are is not something shame to be ashamed of, up to the point that some companies now seize the opportunity. Think about my first chart and are changing the game, suggesting that you can be better if you're not younger, which is exactly going against our, uh, let me say, dogmatism about uh, that uh, young is good, old is bad. You need only simple ideas to start. So you don't need a world technology, as I showed before. This guy, Chuck McCarthy, decided that his best quality was to be empathic and invented the people walker, helping people who were isolated to have a walk with a friend that even they, they don't know. And this has become from a good idea a, a platform of sharing experience and life and companionship with others. Um, there is a Chip Conley, uh, with his program to help you navigate in your after 50s. So basically, he's building a business in telling you what you should do in your life, coaching you what could be the next part of your life. There are um, uh, new kind of care homes. Uh, this is uh, the ambassadors in, uh, in Zurich. I suggest you to check out their website and you see how, for who can afford it, 
and think about the fact that, that the boomers are those that owns the highest uh, heritage in the planet right now. So for who that can afford it, somehow there could be different way of imagining your care homes. There's a lot happening in how to help you retire. And you see on the right that even uh, along the pandemic, end of the day, the biggest worrying was not the health, was the wealth. Um, there is a lot happening in insurances. We are suggesting that if you provide the data, you can have a better price, but also uh, a better care. Um, there are companies which are realizing that the wisdom of their employees is probably more important than just you know keep on hiring people for the myth of youth, but combining old and young is probably the best way, or the generation is probably the best way. CVS, for example, has a policy to uh, have at least 20%, at least 20% of the workforce over 55. There are programs that help you to live and work at home, even when you are retired. Um, you can be hired as a consultant and share your knowledge and expertise, even if you have been pushed out from the uh, workplace for all the crazy policies that sometimes you government are forced to sustain it due to, I would say, bad management of the last 50 years. There's a need of learning and there are platforms that help us keep on learning all over our life. And again, combination of physical and digital is something that it's becoming um, a, a kind of, a, uh, let me say, day operation, just like dating apps. What is interesting is that you see on the left Lumen that was one of the first dating apps for people over 50 has been acquired by Bumble. And now they changed the game. It's not anymore only a dating app form, but it's also a, 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 an app for the dating, yes, but also for the business or for meeting people without any purpose but friendship. There's a lot happening in the sales of new things to understand about who you are. So the channel of sales is literally becoming a driver. And you see, this is all Instagram stuff that I took, all products that are suggesting that you can live quote unquote better. And again, the science has all to be demonstrated. That's why we have to take a look at, at it because there is an opportunity, but also there is a risk. So that's why the science, our advisory comes to play, but we can't shut our eyes. We have to be clearly uh, informed about what's happening and leverage this way, because this way could be a way to help people to live better for longer, like a practice of the Femtech. I specifically three charts I have on technology to help people, um, to help women, sorry, to live better life, because there's a lot happening in research in the last years that realize that women are different from men, guess what? But we, this, this is the society in which we are, that still has based their research mainly on men, and now there's a lot happening on women. Look at what Procter & Gamble has designed a full list of products for the health of women in different stages of life. You can use devices for strengthening the pelvic floor. You can use um, new uh, research in chemistry to help manage the menopause. There's a lot happening in handling our mental well-being through application. And if you need someone and there's nobody available, potentially artificial intelligence could be helpful. There is something happening in our future. We're going to the space. There is happening in drugs where they allowed it. This is uh, a chart from Massachusetts where I lived when marijuana has been formally legalized. And guess who is the community and the demographic which is increasing in purchases? It's the people over 60. Do we have to be blind of it? No, we have to be aware of it and understand if it's something that could be helpful for the health of the population to help them living longer for, for the future. Briefly, what we do at the center. So all this amount of inputs that I gave you, we are translating them in this idea of harness, harnessing all these opportunities with some methodologies. But I think our key point is our mission. Our mission is just to add intelligence to aging and longevity. I guess you've seen there is a lot of intelligence out there, but what is lacking is an intelligence that is coming from the people, you see bottom left, which we think has to be bring, brought back, sorry, to the schema, to the society, to all of us, and the intelligence of experiences what it's good, what it's not, where's the evidence? Can we provide a suggestion on how things are working and what it's good potentially for your specific health? We are trying to combine these two intelligence, as you can see bottom right in a platform, which is still ongoing. It requires us a lot of effort to build it together. But ideally we would like to provide you 
to provide us, to provide anyone some information that can help people to take better decisions on all the possibilities that you've seen before. We're building also an index, which is called Return on Society, which is combining four dimensions, which I guess you perceived from my discussion. The healthy dimensions, the ethics dimension, which is obviously always in the background of what I said, the narrative which is needed and climate change. If you combine these four things and create an index, that's what we're trying to do. We're just providing to our clients not only what is the opportunity in terms of return on society, on, on investment, sorry, but also what is the impact on society. As I said before, we have a community of people that we engage in everything we do, because if you don't listen to the people, we're missing the point. The more the people are involved in the co quote unquote activities, the more we can uh, um, we can literally design a better solutions. And we do it in, a, in, in our fantastic office, which is uh, pretty new. And unfortunately, we couldn't use it for the last year, but it is, has been designed together with people to en enable us to harness this intelligence through some methodological tools that I'll be happy to share in the future. These are the four things that we do as an activity experience and design, we collect data and insights, we do research and horizons, we do predictions about the future, and we support some of our activities through online learning. I just took a selection of four projects and I'm, and I'm done. Um, we're empowering women, as I said before, with a specific community that we over, have opened in the United States. It's our first community because we want to grow in terms of cultural background. So it's not only the UK people that is telling us what's happening, but people from all over the world uh, we hope to op uh, open uh, soon in Canada and hopefully soon in Singapore as well. Um, and the idea just to have also sub communities like this one, which is fully dedicated to women. We have done a fantastic project. I will talk to you in a second with this company, um, which is about uh, uh, um, leveraging a tool well designed to match people that want to volunteer with people that need support inside the corporations. So the idea is just to empower employees to serve others. And we realize that volunteering is a fantastic way to improve your mental well-being. We're using a, a technology in this case, supporting a, a small but very smart company, which is delivering yoga classes remotely, adding a layer of intelligence. So understanding how people is behaving when taking remote lesson. And with a company called Sentient, we have embedded together with the Breathe Happy data points that help us how people is performing during a yoga class and understanding what is good and what is not good. We have designed a kitchen that which is physically there with the population I showed before that can follow the generation over time. And we're testing what is the best feature that a kitchen should have in the different stages of life, when in your 20s or your 90s. Can we design new appliances, new system of interactions, new objects that can follow your life and help you um, live better for longer? Finally, we're using some of these robots which are available on the market um, to suggest that uh, can we walk better? Can we support people to walk better using robotics? And we are literally testing right now. Yesterday, we have a, a test. Today, we have another test this afternoon. And we're involving our community to play with these robots, which basically follows you. And you can load with 23 kilos of groceries or whatever you want. If uh, this thing can help you to uh, have a healthier life, but also if this thing could be a social, let me say, icebreaker, because when you walk followed by a robot, or a robot, trust me, people stops and ask, what the hell is that thing? There is one thing I just wanted to highlight before uh, greeting you and listening for question and answer. We're trying to pack some of the offering that I suggested before in what we have defined the intergenerational suitcase, meaning that we think that employers today represents probably a gateway in which we can accelerate the deployment of innovation for help, uh, helping people live longer. Uh, employers are becoming more and more reliable entity inside of the perception of citizens, that citizens versus government is just like employee versus employers. As you can see, the frame is smaller, the, re the interaction is closer, and there is a growing trust of employees toward the employers about caring about their future. So we put together some of the work that we're doing in a packaging that we're offering to the employers to help the quality of life of their individuals. That's come out in an offering that we have defined the longevity as a service. So we're trying to provide services that help people to live longer and healthier inside the employers, so inside the frame of a company, because we think it could be the fastest way in which we can reach the people. All the news that I was talking about, you can follow us 
on the website. And you, I think you will find every day something new because you are working hard to bring the innovation I described before to the everyday life, testing it and involving the population. My takeaways, aging is malleable. Please consider a narrative change from healthy aging to healthy longevity. Think about the visibility of the people. People wants to become visible. Aging population, it's claiming out their individuality and their presence in this world that is tend to forget them. Their new sales channels and system of integration of offerings through very personal experience. Again, think about Instagram, just one of the example on how people are showing themselves and buying things. And finally, the workplace could be a microcosm of the whole society. So employers could become a way in which we can accelerate a wise um, introduction of tools for those cheeses that I said in the beginning that can help you to live for longer. We are very good in connecting the invisible dots. We are working hard to combine machines and people, understanding how cognitive computing is helping us to understand more about the effects of the innovation over people. And we're empowering generation thriving together because there is no way that this world could work better only putting together the people and the generation. As Frank Lloyd Wright used to say, the longer I live, the more beautiful life becomes. So why stop when the best starts? Thank you so much. I stop sharing the screen. Thanks very much. Thanks very very much. much. That's what a fantastic presentation. Uh, really exciting. I mean, I learned, uh, one always thinks one knows quite a bit when one reads things as a scientist, but they are, the holistic approach, that's quite amazing to, to see this. and. At the end, that's what your institute also does, trying to find also technology uh, uh, solutions rather than uh, take a pill a day or 10 pills a day to live longer uh, or reverse aging. So I have a couple of questions here, which are just, I think we should just answer this live. Uh, the very first one uh, is basically about uh, healthy aging in developing countries. So that's uh, definitely very, uh, a, a very important question, particularly here in the Southeast Asia, compared to your studies uh, in the US and the UK. So the question were here directly, most of the existing literature focus on developed countries where material and technologies are more available and advanced, but the experiences and models may not be applicable in developing countries. If we conduct research in less developed settings, what should, we, should be our aims? And what can we learn from such a different context? For instance, uh, how can we benefit from studying health longevity in rural East Asian regions? Yeah, so uh, absolutely a great question. I think I, I try to answer, uh, and I'm so sorry, it was so compressed. So we'll be happy to have a, you know, a deeper and, and wider discussion about it. But the first thing is, as you could see, the idea of opening communities from UK in different countries is exactly the first answer to, to your question. Um, first of all, let me say, in UK, there is a lot of awareness about inequalities in aging, specifically in UK, okay? So the topic of inequalities is being, let me say, treated from a sociological and gerontological perspective quite well, but very in the UK environment, meaning that we know that at least there are inequalities, first of all, all over the world, and second, are very different in terms of the origin of these inequalities. So the cultural background um, for each country is very different, again, of the purpose of aging. In Brazil, you would like to age beautifully. In, in, in Japan, you would like to age gracefully. And these two logic of aging is already one of the big things that can think about how very different from a cultural perspective people are facing the different stages of life. So the first for, things for us is just creating that knowledge that it's coming from the daily life of the people, not only in UK, but gathering this knowledge from other communities. As I said, we open in the United States. Canada is probably our next. We hope, as I said, in uh, uh, to open in Singapore. We will open in China by design because we have an agreement with the Chinese government, the UK and the Chinese government. This is one first thing. The second, I am following uh, with a very um, personal interest, but also professional interest, uh, the evolution of, let me say, innovation in the African countries, which represent obviously an extreme somehow, if you see the, the planet from uh, um, the disadvantaged countries. And I think that the process of innovation that it's happening in Africa is following more or less the process of innovation, which is happening moreover, uh, more or less in the same other countries in the world. What I'm trying to say is that 
there is a lot happening in the, the evolution and the capabilities provided by certain type of science and a certain type of technologies combined together. I would say it's empowered by a, a logic of uh, funding innovation through very different uh, means that it, in my opinion is empowering specific solution for different geos based on the needs of those population and the cultural background, which is now raising up. I can count hundreds of hubs of innovation in, in the Eastern, in the Far East, um, in, in Africa as well, meaning that there is a flow of very specific solution based for the needs of those population, which is becoming probably one of the next opportunity for many investors. So if the investor sees the opportunity, I think we have to be wise on how we, um, uh, let me say, leverage those investments. But if you're wise enough to drive those investments, uh, we, under certain rules, ethical rules, as I said before, are crucial. I think we can speed up specific solutions that are beneficial for that population in that region, but I'm pretty sure that can be beneficial for people all over the world. So the point is, if you don't share the knowledge and if you don't understand the differences from the country, we're missing the opportunity. But the, the opportunity in reality is sharing the knowledge. That's exactly what we're trying to do from our uh, research center. Yeah, Nick, I think that's, that's definitely, it's, it's clear. I think there will be a lot of investors already here, as you say, in the uh, Southeast Asia uh, region to, to benefit from this. But do you suggest to repeat studies which you have done, the impact of aging, inequality in workplaces and so on, also here in Asia, before we start implementing it? Because, I mean, it took you 20, 40 years to get there, and it might take as long here. Or just jump it and start already applying uh, your outcomes? Look, uh, yeah, uh, say that that uh, must be the evidence. I am a jumper uh, because we need solution. We need to test uh, all these things quickly because then we can improve, change and adapt. But there is one thing I would like to underline for all of us. The purchase experience of Amazon is the same from Alaska to South Africa, mm. to China, mm. to Australia. Yep. So that there is, a, let me say, some activities in our process on how our mental processes on how we deal with the reality that are becoming a standard. So that what I'm trying to say is that there is a, also a globalization of certain things that would suggest us that we should have to apply certain type of solutions or ideas. I would say quickly in several contexts understand what could be the differences, engaging the population. If you engage the population from scratch, if you co-design with them, you then can design something that maybe half of it is, is already well-designed, you just can shape it and improve it based on your logic. And I've yeah. seen a lot of startups taking the basic concept, think about banking and translate it for the need of that population specifically, it's just there where you can add the intelligence. You don't have to reinvent yeah. the wheel. And I have actually right on this, Nick, uh, one of the another question from uh, a viewer about using uh, social media. Uh, so this person says older folk tend to be more popular on TikTok compared to Facebook or Instagram. So what's your opinion on this? Yeah, yeah. So I think for what we see today, for a certain level of the population, I would say it's mainly the boomers. Let me say Facebook is almost over. It's just for, for a slice of the population. So there is a new, let me say, community which is showing themselves on Instagram. And TikTok probably is the next one that should have to keep an eye. But there will be something after TikTok. So my point is, let's think about this channel as channels that we have to leverage, not we have to be afraid of, of shamed of. If we leverage them correctly, we can really gain an opportunity for the population. Because the population, it's us. It's us on those channels. It's not there, you are old, they are others. It's us who are the old ones. And where are we? Are we on the channels? Yes. So let's leverage them. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's a great question. Another one I'd like to, to add <coughs> is from Denise. It's about climate change. The importance of climate change and the human actions now in the future. Does any of your work deal mm -hmm. with this matter of human environment interaction, healthy workplace? I think you mentioned earlier the kitchen biophilic design in cities, benefits of people having nearby nature exposure on a regular base. 
Yeah, so first of all, we realized finally, because <laughs> I guess the proof that we need was to stop the world. And the pandemic has been a disaster, but also allowed us to see things that we couldn't see before. So that's the impact over our health. So now it's very clear. And immediately after, you, you remember, many cities decided to push this idea of having less cars, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things that I showed you so quickly, that little robot following you, is exactly one of the idea we have if... It's 10,000 steps enough every day. Let's say for a second, yes. How can I promote you to go out and do your 10,000 step instead of being you know, uh, put inside a, uh, an electric bicycle or put in a car? Can you walk more thanks to certain technology? Uh, we're doing two experiments. One is the one I showed you. The other one is with a company called Tonus, which is developing fabric you embed in your trousers, literally, and helps you to walk with a sort of a stimulus to your uh, legs muscles, meaning that there is ways in which we can support a, a better behavior for the climate. So not using cars anymore or other devices and do the things that we are the best at walking and leveraging that as a, as a, let me say, a new capability for our health of the future. Can we combine smart cities and new technologies that can support ideas of walking? I think yes. And this is just one example. There are many examples related to climate change. But the more we think about climate change and aging as one thing that have to be, let me say, um, compensated parallelly, I think it's probably we're going in the right direction to design future cities of the future, but also trajectory of longevity for ourselves in the future. So artificial intelligence will definitely play a large role there. Absolutely. Yeah. That's something that we have to, to work a lot on. It's something that, again, we have to bring it to the uh, aging narrative. Today, artificial intelligence is not yet in the aging narrative. And when I mean the aging narrative, I mean not only in medical search, not only in, in drugs discovery. It's in the everyday life. It's in the yeah. everyday life. And that's, that's another question uh, actually based on this technology and uh, advanced technology. It's about, again, um, uh, in having a life experience of people in a low income and low resource countries, what would you, uh, sorry, what would you propose for a long and healthy life for people who may not have the means to own or pursue technology as some of them you suggested? Yeah, so first of all, I think there is, a, there is one thing that we have to think about, which is the, the shape of the economy. Um, we know that we can probably accelerate the return on society that I showed you before, only if we show some of the brands there is an opportunity so that the cost of technologies could be lowered and be more accessible to others. This is one first thing that I think we should have to start thinking about. So instead of keep on looking to find solution only to feed these people, just to use the, let me say, the rules of the economy in which we're in, that we like it or not, it's the economy in which we're in, and have those rules to be quicker delivered to the broader population as possible. This is one thing. The second is a matter of narrative. It's impossible to, uh, let me say, involve more and more population if we don't change the narrative at political level, if we don't show from, uh, I would say, as a political perspective, what could be the change in the life of population if this change is not reaching everyone. Mm -hmm. And a third thing, I guess, we should have to provide opportunities to every level in terms of education. Now, the matter of education, I think, is still the key. If we think about the world where you don't even have the Wi-Fi or the internet, that's where the gap has to be solved. So first of all, we have to find ways to empower the more the population to, to receive the right information. Right information is important, but at least information that can suggest what could be the, I would say, is healthy journey. I think it's probably one of the first things that we have to do. Then we can put policies that can reach a broader population and then increase the life of people in disadvantaged countries. There is something that has to be done by design. But again, most of this thing is in the hands of the politics. It's less in the hands of all our attempts to try to change the game. Yeah, thanks. And I think there were a few other questions here which I can't go into detail now, but many of them were around uh, uh, money, poor countries, retiring at 65, living until 85. But I think what you addressed is probably a cheap way to get information is having access to internet and social media, maybe which is targeted to people which are older and don't need so much fancy things, but this ability to choose uh, uh, and have a choice and choice of information, different information, I think is probably the very first step. Look, I think it's, it's literally 
what we tend to have as a commodity is not in many countries. So my point is that have to become a global commodity. That's one thing. But the second thing is that do not reinvent the wheel. So again, I think the, the real opportunity is on the existing things that we know works. And there are many examples, honestly, many examples that are very low cost could empower the life of individuals and build on top of those the different nuances that you have at every cultural level, that's what could make the difference. Again, I've seen these beautiful projects in Africa, which were using the technology that you can use almost everywhere from very small, I would say, poor countries and startups, which added a layer of knowledge about what people needed there, and that have become a game changer for the population. Uh, mm. And I think it's probably a game that we should have to suggest to local organization to embed on established, I would say, strong uh, infrastructures, what the difference of your cultural heritage could need in that specific areas. That could become one of fast game changer to help people that live in disadvantaged, in disadvantaged areas to yeah. gain quickly an advantage. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Uh, that's absolutely fantastic summarize. So I have unfortunately to come now to the end. Uh, and before I uh, end here, I just want to summarize, I think the very first pictures you showed, uh, Michelangelo, 88 years, and a lot of other people hundreds of years ago without any medical and you know, uh, AI easy. technology. So lifestyle, when it comes back down to, is still very, very important. Yes, and we tend to forget about it, but it's exactly, it's ourselves the first sculpture of yeah. that statue and could yeah. become a fantastic piece of art, could yeah. become a fantastic it's our life let's work on it intercession here great then uh, thanks very much nick i think your your institute is up on the website so if anybody wants to get a hold of chris or know more Please about what to develop it's all there it's fantastic there i mean we always have to have something to strive for uh, but i think as you, as you said copying uh, and at repeating uh, work with science which has been done already is the waste of time and money which we don't have anymore and just progressing on building on existing knowledge thanks very thank much you. thank you andreas for the invitation thanks thank you much. so much thanks so much bye-bye bye-bye bye-bye